Hi, this is session two of uh, the final series of Walking with Jesus Christ, Future Focus. And if you have a look at the, the screen here, you'll see I've summarized what we looked at in the first of our sessions, where we established the idea that God has a purpose, that we're walking with Jesus Christ with an end goal in mind. We're not just walking around in circles for the sake of it. We have a destination. And on the right-hand side of the screen, I've illustrated these five principles that we've been looking at in this series on walking with Jesus Christ. Interpersonal relationships, family life, citizenship, stress and anxiety, and the use of money. Now, what I've done on the screen here is I've summarized how these things teach us about the purpose of God. That God wants a relationship with us. And he's doing that by creating a family, a family that is separate from the, the direction that this world is heading in, the politics of this world, the, the here and now. He's looking for a people who, through trials and sufferings, develop character, develop the glorious character of God. And the reason behind of all this is because he has invited us to help Jesus Christ rule this world in the coming kingdom of God. And that's why he's given us responsibilities now, like the use of money, to prepare us for that end goal. Now, what I want to look at in this second session is to develop this idea that God is building a family. And much of the Bible centers around this very important fact. It's not just that God wants to fill this earth with his glory, but he wants to do it by having a family. By having children that he raises up. Now we understand this if we go right back to the beginning of the Bible. In one of the most fundamental verses of scripture. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. The chapter about God creating the heavens and earth. The, the pinnacle of his creation was mankind. Where it says that God made man and woman in his image and likeness. So Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now in that verse, which really encapsulates the very core of God's purpose, we learn a couple of things. First of all, we learn that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Now let, we'll think about that in a moment, what exactly that means. And also, God has given us a responsibility. God gave man the purpose to have dominion or to rule over his creation. And what that ultimately looks forward to is the kingdom of God, the, the dominion where God will give responsibility to his children to take care of his world that he created. So that's what Genesis 1 ultimately looks forward to. Now what does it mean then to be made in the image and likeness of God? Well, just a few chapters later in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3, we have very similar language where Adam, who was the first man created by God, we're told he had lived 130 years and he fathered a son. Now listen to this language. He fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth you'll see the very similar language there God made man and woman in his image and likeness uh, Adam had a son Seth in his image and likeness now just think about that with your own children if you have them or all of you have parents and what tends to happen in families is that children take after their parents we look like our parents. We have similar mannerisms. We have similar personalities, similar ways of thinking, similar ways of doing things. When you see a parent and a child, very often you'll notice that and think, well, yes, I can definitely see the family resemblance. And that's what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. God is creating people, or rather children, who he wants to take after him who reflect who he is. And in our first session, we saw what God is like, that God is a God of mercy and grace and so forth. 
So we can look at other passages that develop this idea that God is creating a family. In the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 45, Isaiah comments on God's purpose in creation. Now, look at this language in verse 11. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, Ask of me things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. Now, look at the language there in the context of God creating the earth. He talks about the creation of his children. That's what God was doing. God wants a family. And in the scriptures, God is defined as a father. Some people think of the the God of the Bible or or gods in general as these uh, very powerful overlords who dominate the heavens. That's not the picture that the the scriptures paint of God, although he is a powerful creator of all things. But primarily, the scriptures define God as a father, a father who is raising his children for his ultimate purpose. So let's think about, again, about the, the ultimate purpose of God. Why is he raising a family? He wants to fill this earth with his glory. He wants to fill this earth with his children who reflect what he is like. And he's given us insight into the, the family values that he wants us to develop. What his family stands for. We looked at this verse in our previous session. In Exodus chapter 34, where God revealed to Moses what he is like. And what he expects his children to be like. That he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. Those are the the family traits that God is looking for. So if we want to be children of God, if we want to have a part in God's ultimate purpose, then It's these family values that uh, we ought to be developing now with a view to being part of that eternal purpose of God as his children. Now, I want us to have a look at something rather interesting about the language in these verses in Exodus chapter 34. You notice this list of characteristics, mercy and grace and patience and justice and so forth, But there's one characteristic which is repeated. Whenever the Bible repeats something, it's there for us to take notice. For some reason, it says in verse 6 that God abounds in steadfast love. And then in verse 7, we're reminded of that, that he keeps steadfast love for thousands. Now, what the author of Exodus 34 is inviting us to do here is to focus in on this repetition of this this phrase steadfast love and to look at the structure of the text and very often the Bible is written in in a, a poetic way that gives us further um, insight into what the author wants us to understand Now, this word steadfast love is a a fascinating word. It's it's translated from one word in the original Hebrew. It's the word kesed. And it's the kind of love that is part of a relationship that you have with somebody, especially a relationship you have in the bonds of a covenant. It's the kind of love between a husband and a wife. The, the love that binds them together. We're not talking about romantic love, that, that love that, that can wear out over time. We're talking about the kind of love that binds people together, whether it's a husband and a wife or the bonds of friendship or the kind of love that God has for his creation, the kind of covenant love that God has for those he calls to his purpose. That's one of the core characteristics of God. Another word that we could use to define this characteristic is loyalty. Just think of how important loyalty is in marriage, for example, or in friendship, or in our relationship with God. Now, 
the reason why this is doubled in the text, why we learn about this loyalty twice, is because there is a structure to this text. And I've, I've put it there on the screen there. You can see this parallelism in which God's character is defined in this kind of poetic way. It's a beautiful thing to look at. So on the outside of this parallelism, we have the basic characteristics of God, how he treats people. He is merciful to people. He is gracious to people. He is patient with people. He is a God who forgives people. He is a God who is just. So that's how God treats his creation. And those are the sort of family values then that God wants us to develop. Develop them now in our relationships, again, with a view to God's eternal purpose. And then we come further in this parallelism to this repetition of this steadfast love, this loyal love of God. And then right in the middle is what I would call God's core characteristic of faithfulness. He is a God who is reliable. He is a God who is trustworthy. He is a God who we can depend on. He is a God who is described in Scripture as a rock. And so we can put our faith in Him because He is faithful. And not only is He faithful, but He is loyal. And not only is He loyal, but He is compassionate and generous and patient and forgiving and just. So this is a, a way for us to remember what God's character is like and what God is expecting of us as his children, as part of his eternal purpose. Now, just to close out this session, another way to look at this and, and a metaphor that I found very useful is to think of God's purpose as him building a house upon a rock. In Revelation chapter 21, we looked at this verse in our previous session. God wants to dwell with his creation. God is creating a family. He's creating a household of people. So think of God's purpose like that. Think of God's purpose as a dwelling place or as a house, full of a household of people who glorify God, who have these wonderful core characteristics of the eternal God. So the atmosphere in this house is of mercy and grace and of patience and of forgiveness and of justice. Just think what our families would be like if we developed those things right now. What would our relationships be like in work and in other places where we interact with people, where we have interpersonal relationships, if we were merciful and gracious and kind to one another. So that's the atmosphere that's inside this house. But the important thing, it is a house. It is not just an open park. It's a place that's enclosed by four walls and a roof. And the people in that house are loyal to that house. They belong in that house. Just like our own houses right now, that we don't just allow any stranger to waltz in. And we are meant to be loyal to our families now, loyal to the household. And so the the fact that this is a house helps us to remember that core characteristic of God, of steadfast love, of loyal love. That's the sort of character God is looking for in his children. And the house is built on a rock. It has a sure foundation. It's not going to fall over. And that will help us remember this central characteristic of God, of faithfulness, of dependability, that rock-like trustworthiness of God. And God is expecting us to develop that kind of trustworthiness too. He wants us to be people of integrity, people who can be depended on now, in our interpersonal relationships, in our family life, with the goal that we're the kind of people that God is developing now as his children who can be part of his eternal purpose. So that ends our second session in Future Focus. And in our third session, we're going to uh, develop this theme a little bit more.